Hello and welcome to 60 Science Early Computers from the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. My name is Genevieve Kaplan and I'm the Director of Education here at the museum. Today we're going to be looking at early computers from the 1950s and 60s and how the construction of those computers has helped to lead to many of the technological advances that we have today. We are very lucky to be joined by Texas Instruments Alumni Association member Max Post who will be sharing the history of early computers with a special emphasis on some of the many advancements that Texas Instruments made during the 1950s and 60s in the area of computers and computer science. We would like to thank Texas Instruments and the Texas Instruments Alumni Association for supporting this program. In the 1950s and 60s, people didn't walk around with cell phones or iPads or any other type of tablet or computer. Computers where they existed were made up of large rooms of machinery, whereas today we can carry on our cell phone an entire computer going wherever and whenever we want. An interesting thing to note is that a simple flash drive that we use today just to move files around actually would contain more memory than some of the earliest computers that would take up entire large rooms. So to share with us more about the history of computers and their development, I would like to introduce Max Post from the Texas Instruments Alumni Association. Well, Genevieve, thanks for your invitation uh, today and the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, computing. To understand uh, what changes were going on in the 1960s, let's, let's just look back at the state of computing in the prior decades. If you worked in an office in the 1940s or 50s, you might have used uh, one of these mechanical uh, adding machines. The Burroughs model is shown on the left. Notice the handle that you pull down, this would add numbers. And there was a paper tape to print out the answers. Pretty handy, but no memory, and it was a little noisy. The photo on the right shows an early comptometer. It was full of whirling gears. It could do a lot more than an adding machine, but it was expensive. When I was working in uh, TI's corporate headquarters in the early 60s, we had one of these machines. And it was operated by a Mr. Grant Thompson. I had to go down the hall to his office, show him the numbers. Uh, he would enter them into the machine, and then he would furiously turn this little crank on the side, and soon the answer would appear on the dials. Well, this was much better, but it was not too handy. Well, during World War II, the military recognized the need for better computers to direct the gunfire for their large cannons. So work begun on a computer called the ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It's being built at the University of Pennsylvania. It's now considered to be the first general purpose programmable digital computer. However, by the time the war was, uh, the machine was completed, the war was over. Well, the ENIAC was powered by more than 17,000 vacuum tubes, or valves, as the British called them. Why valves? Well, they could turn on and off the flow of electrons, which could be used to represent zeros or ones in logic circuits based on the binary numbering system. Well, vacuum tubes were developed in the early 1900s, and they sparked the rapid growth of radios uh, in the 1930s and 40s. In the photo on the left, you can see what these look like inside of a radio. Various tubes had different functions. Uh, some could amplify an analog signal, and some could uh, rectify the power, that is, turn it into from alternating current into direct current. When TVs came along in the 1940s and the uh, 50s, <clears throat> I can remember that uh, friends would ask if I could fix their TVs, which is usually a bad vacuum tube. They, they burned out pretty frequently. 
so it was easy to find a replacement at a nearby convenience store, which stocked all kinds of vacuum tubes. Well, by the 1950s, the industry began to produce large room-sized computers, which you can see on the photo on the right here. These were using vacuum tubes, but most engineers were still using their trusty slide rules. The slide rule was uh, an analog uh, computer in a way. It could multiply, divide, it could find logarithms. But it had limitations in terms of accuracy to more than a decimal place or two, depending on your eyesight. But all of that was about to change in late 1947 when three scientists at the Bell Labs discovered that a small piece of crystalline material, uh, they could make it work like a gate. The key was germanium, a semiconductor material where electrons only flowed in one direction. When a signal was applied, it could control the flow, that is the on and off, just like the valve or the vacuum tube. They call their invention the transistor. Well, it was publicly announced in uh, June of 1948, and the military right away could see the advantage of it. And they were the first customers. Well, by 1951, the U.S. government persuaded Bell Labs to license the technology, and all of the big uh, electronic companies lined up, such as General Electric, Westinghouse, RCA, IBM, and others. Well, Texas Instruments was a small company here in Dallas in the business of geophysical oil exploration and uh, defense equipment, such as radar. At first, uh, their request was refused for a license. You're just too small. But Eric Johnson, the head of the company at the time, finally wore their lawyers down, and, they, and TI got the license, $25,000. Well, the transistor was much smaller than the vacuum tubes and more reliable, but soon they discovered a problem. Germanium transistor just did not work at higher temperatures, so this limited the applications. It was known that another semiconductor material, silicon, could solve the problem, but no one had figured out how do you grow a silicon crystal. Well, in 1954, years ahead of industry expectations, TI introduced the first commercially available silicon transistor. This is shown in the photo, uh, placed on a stamp so you can see the size of it. Before long, TI was the leader in semiconductor devices and began expanding its manufacturing plants in the U.S. and abroad. Well, TI's executive vice president, Pat Haggerty at the time, had an idea that someday transistors could be made cheap enough to be used in all kinds of consumer products like radios, making them smaller and less costly. So he set up a team of engineers and challenged them to make a small radio with only four transistors. In a short time, they succeeded and presented him with the radio. Well, TI then took the radio and approached several of these large electronic companies giving them a chance to manufacture the radio, but none were interested. So Pat found a small company in Indiana that agreed to build and market the radio under the name Regency. It was announced in October of 1954 in time for the Christmas buying season. It was an instant hit at $49.95. The success of the radio led to increased orders for Texas Instruments uh, at several companies that entered the market. <coughs> the story was told later about an, uh, the head of IBM uh, went to a department store and bought a large number of the radios in New York. And he gave them to his engineers, commenting, if this little company in Texas can make a radio work with transistors, why aren't we using them in computers? Well, IBM would become one of TI's largest customers for transistors in the 1960s. In this photo, you see Mr. Haggerty on the left. He was president at the time. He's talking with Eric Johnson, chairman of TI's board. Well, the 1960s would impact both men in ways they had never expected. <clears throat> in the early 1960, the year of 1960, Pat had an idea that one day, uh, computers would be used for more than just writing payroll checks. 
They would be used to help managers run their businesses. Well, he didn't just dream about it, he acted on it. He set up two teams, of six each, one to work on business applications, the other to put TI's accounting books on the computer. I was fortunate to be one of the six on the business planning team, and it was quite an experience. Well, Eric Johnson's life also changed when sometime after the assassination of President Kennedy, the mayor of Dallas left to take the job as congressman. The Dallas business community then asked Mr. Johnson to serve as mayor. Well, he already had a full-time job and he was reluctant to do this. But his wife told him he should take the job of guiding Dallas through a most difficult period. Mr. Johnson listened and he served as mayor for seven years, 1964 to 1971. And he was a key leader in the development of the DFW Regional Airport, which we enjoy today. IBM was an early adopter of transistors, and here's an early mainframe, the 7090. Uh, by the mid-1960s, um, IBM uh, supplied almost half the world's large computers. Well, if you look in the background, uh, you see that it's a very large uh, machine altogether. If you look in the background, you can see these tape drives with the small circular tapes, magnetic tapes on here. Well, this was a big part of the space required in a computer room. But at the time, it was the best solution for the storage of data. Well, IBM was then later a pioneer in magnetic data storage on rotating drums and then on disk and eventually hard disk drives. But for the computing world, all of this was about to change again in late 1958 when TI engineer Jack Kilby had an idea and invented the integrated circuit. Jack had been worrying about this problem for quite a while, quite a long time. And the problem he saw was that there were so many parts that had to be soldered together on a circuit board to make a system work. And those, were, those connections were subject to breaks and failures. So Jack thought, why can't we just embed all of these parts, the transistors, the resistors, the, all of those wires, why can't we just put them in one solid piece of, of semiconductor material? So with the help of three technicians, while most of the other employees were on summer vacation, they fabricated the world's first integrated circuit. Well, when Jack's boss returned from vacation, uh, he was given a, a demonstration and it worked. Well, his boss thought, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, Jack, but uh, I'm not sure it's practical. Well, later on, he decided uh, he would invite somebody over to see the demo. Guess who he called? Pat Haggerty. Well, Mr. Haggerty instantly saw the value and he encouraged an all-out effort to get the idea into the market. In the year 2000, Jack Kilby was honored by receiving the Nobel Prize in physics for this invention. Later on, Jack commented, if Gordon Moore of Intel had been alive, he would have shared in the Nobel Prize. Mr. Moore developed the process for manufacturing integrated circuits. Well, unlike the transistor, the initial response from most of the military customers was lukewarm. Something like, well, uh, why don't you come back someday when this really works and we'll talk to you. Well, then uh, one of our engineers, Harvey Cragen, built the first digital equipment using integrated circuits. And it was demonstrated to the U.S. Air Force. Uh, the integrated circuit version was 50 times lighter and 100 times smaller than the transistorized version of the equipment. Well, this would be a big advantage for systems in aircraft and also those in space. TI was soon awarded an Air Force contract to speed development of the integrated circuit. By the 1960s, this tiny IC chip was being designed into multiple electronic systems like the Minuteman missiles, the Apollo moon program, and other military systems. Well, the, uh, in the early years, these chips were expensive and they were hard to make. 
but the engineers continued to work to improve the process and to lower the cost. Well, with the success of the integrated circuit in military applications, this technology spread to other applications. Other companies in the industry were uh, innovating and introducing new products, such as Intel, uh, located in California. In 1971, they introduced the first microprocessor. This was a CPU uh, computer processing unit on a single chip. In Intel had earlier pioneered solid state memory in 1969 and also random access memory, or RAMs as we call them now, RAM chips in the 1970. Well, computer companies such as uh, Digital Equipment Corporation in the Boston area were introducing uh, smaller computers called mini computers. Uh, it meant that companies didn't have to take everything to a large central computer and this opened the era of what is called distributed computing. The idea was that why can't we locate these computers in factories, branch offices, close to the users? And this opened up then again a, another whole range of new applications. Well by now things were going well with the integrated circuit technology in the military and the computer markets, but they were viewed as too expensive again for consumer products like radios, TVs. Well Mr. Haggerty thought we needed a bold way to show how the technology could someday be used in consumer hands. So he persuaded Jack Kilby to set up a team in his lab to develop a handheld calculator. Well, the team decided first they needed to make a model, um, or what we call a breadboard, out of conventional products, uh, transistors, resistors, other things. So you can see it on the left, a uh, pretty, pretty large collection of things. Uh, but it did work, and so then once, once they'd proven that it could be done, then the, then the other engineers came and did circuit design. They made an IC chipset. And when they had fabricated and produced it, they delivered the world's first handheld calculator to Mr. Haggerty's office. Well, initially, uh, TI just sold the chipsets, the calculator chipsets, to customers who were already in the business. For example, in April of 1970, Canon introduced the first commercial handheld computer based on these TI chips. It sold for $400. But the TI engineers continued development work on calculator chips and soon they were able to get all the functions of the calculator down to a single chip. And in April of 1972, the company introduced the data math calculator priced at $149.95. Again, it was an instant success and later on TI would develop other calculators as well as a line of educational or learning aid products. Well, one of the best of these, uh, best known of these, was the Speak and Spell, which you may have seen in the 1982 movie, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Do you remember E.T. trying to phone home using a Speak and Spell? The key to the operation of the Speak and Spell was a voice recognition chip. T.I. did not invent the voice technology, but it made it less costly by making it a single chip. With all the work done across the industry, voice recognition technology now is commonly used in our cell phones, our tablets, and computers. Well, by the 1970s and 80s now, the idea of portable electronics was really beginning to take off in the industry. For example, uh, TI introduced a uh, terminal, a portable terminal, the Silent 700, it connected through a telephone and a, then a modem, and it could send and receive data over ordinary phone lines. And this was a, a big deal at the time. You see an early compact portable computer. It was made by the company based in Houston at the time. It was the first to be compatible with IBM's portable computer. This meant that the compact could run programs that people had developed for the IBM computer. And Compaq would later become part of Hewlett Packard. Well, you can see these, these early uh, portable computers were pretty heavy. Some of them weighed 30 or 40 pounds. 
Well, I don't think you would want to be carrying these around in your backpacks today. But as industry continued to progress, new companies entering, such as Apple, into the market with uh, technology and creative designs, this would bring us the smaller, uh, lighter weight laptops and tablets we use today. And you know the rest of the story. Having portable objects, portable computers, and spread around created the need then for us to be connected. And this, of course, then paved the way for the internet. Well, so much for history. I hope you have an idea now of how important the discoveries in the 1960s were to today's computers and to new applications such as smartphones and, and then the multiple uh, semiconductor chips used in cars today to improve uh, both safety and performance. Well, we focus today mainly on uh, digital technology, but in the real world it just can't do it all. Um, analog semiconductors uh, have to be used in the systems to convert things that are continuously varying, like sound, temperature, pressure. Uh, this all has to be converted into digital numbers so it can be processed in computers. Then, uh, after the computer processes all of this, it sends it back to us, but again, this, these digital numbers have to be converted into audio so we can hear the music or the voice. Electronic systems also need power uh, chips to rectify and regulate the systems. So while TI today still produces some digital integrated circuits, its main focus is on analog devices where they are the industry leader. While it's difficult to predict uh, what the world of computing will look like in say 20 or 10 or 20 years even, if we look at the past and the inventions of the 60s, it's a good bet that the electronic systems will be smaller, they'll be smarter, uh, less costly, we hope, and doing more functions than we can even imagine today. And we've talked a lot about computer hardware, but in truth, uh, innovations in software, which is the computer code, and the innovative ideas of people or new applications are, are just as vital as the digital hardware. And I'm impressed by the interest all of you have shown in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, or STEM as we call it, by your participation in events like this sixth floor series. At, and no doubt you will be making your own contributions to the future of computing in the years ahead. I want to thank you again and wish all of you the best in your continuing studies. Thank you. All right, well now we've had a wonderful overview of computers from the 1950s and 60s up through today. And what we're going to do now is take a look at some of the objects that Mr. Post was talking about that he has graciously brought in for us to be able to look at. As you remember, in the previous session, uh, Mr. Post was talking about crystals. And here we have this blue crystal that uh, was grown to really kind of show you what crystals would have looked like. and then. Um, the crystals would have been uh, cut down into slices, am I correct? The crystals were grown into big round crystals and then they were sliced into wafers, yes. All right. Um, and we actually have a silicone wafer that um, Mr. Post has brought in, so I'm going to let you talk about some of that. Okay. Well, the, these of course are rock or qu quartz crystals. That are, that are growing. These are not uh, germanium or silicon, so they wouldn't be used for that, but they're an illustration of, of crystals in nature. And uh, <coughs> it took a while, in fact, all the way up to 1947, basically, to somebody to grow a germanium crystal and then start making transistors. And these, these are just examples, if you can see them, of the little transistors that were made early on. And they literally uh, would grow the crystal and then put it into, into 
chop it into slices. And, and those crystals, by the way, were pretty small. Here, here was is just an illustration of some of the, this was kind of in the 19, uh, in the 50s, uh, state of the art. These are probably uh, one inch crystals around. And they, they would take these and then chop them, cut them up into little pieces. And then these were put uh, with some circuit wires, three wires on there, uh, <coughs> and then sealed sealed in. They had to, to weld the wires then to the chip, which was pretty tricky to do that. That was the whole secret of the process. And then they could make uh, something that would replace a vacuum tube. And this, of course, was the state-of-the-art vacuum tubes in the 1950s. And in all the radios, TVs, uh, in the 40s and 50s up to that time. Can you tell and us a uh, little bit more about vacuum tubes? <coughs> well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> vacuum tubes, uh, they have a, there's an emitter in here that will emit electrons, and then there's a, a, a metal plane here on the other side that collects the electrons, so thus the, the electricity is flowing, or the electrons are flowing from the uh, anode to the collector. And when another signal is applied, then it turns that off. And so this is why the British called it a valve. It was like turning on water, turning off water. And why was that important? Well, if the water was on, that represented a one. If there was no water flowing, it's a zero, or no electrons flowing, it's a zero. So you have zero and one, which is the basis of the binary system. Uh, Two, two, two states you can be in, and you can raise that to how many powers you want to, depending on how many of these you have in the circuit. And so that was <coughs> really started in, in the radio world and then in the early computing world before transistors and then later integrated circuits replaced them. So, as I say, this was state of the art in the early days, and this is. Uh, a big step along the way. This is a, uh, actually I think this is not as big as today's. This was, <laughs> uh, I won this in an auction. It's autographed by Jack Kilby. It was a fundraiser. And these are literally uh, millions and millions of transistors on this chip, uh, on this big slice that you see. And they're even larger today. If you can imagine, this is a giant crystal that's growing in a furnace uh, over 2,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and it's being slowly pulled up out of molten silicon uh, connected only by the seed. And to make this little crystal grow, we start with the seed. And it's the same process on the big crystal that is grown. And fortunately, these grow faster. It took like six or seven days to grow that one. But this is done in a much shorter time. But it's, it's, it's a lot of material to be dealing with. And by the way, it has to be very high purity. And you'll find articles on the internet talking about from sand to silicon. Well, yeah, sand has a lot of silicon in it. It's, however, not the source of this material. Metallurgical grade material is used to make these crystals. And this is found in mines in Norway and other parts of the world. And that's treated, it's you know, 90, 90, high 90 plus percent uh, purity. And then all those impurities have to be taken out. You get down to parts per billion to make these wafers. Wow. And they're working on even larger ones. And it, here's the whole idea. You can see that the bigger this slice, the more you can put on it and, and the cost goes down. And that's how it's a key factor in the industry getting its cost down so it can be in computers, radios, telephones we use today. Welcome back. And now we're going to work on growing our own crystal, just like the ones that Mr. Post was talking about that were used in early computers and constructing semiconductors. We have a couple of different crystals here in front of us. 
We have this blue crystal that we showed you earlier. This is one that we grew from a kit. We purchased a kit through Amazon. This particular one was the National Geographic kit where you can grow three different crystals of different colors. We grew this blue one and it's really interesting to look at it because it's growing in all these different directions and sizes. Um, so it's just fascinating to look at. But sometimes we wanna be able to do these experiments and we wanna be able to do them without having to go out and use uh, fancy kits and things like that. So I'm gonna show you how to grow your own crystal using items that you have around the house and maybe one item that you might need to go to the grocery store to get, but otherwise you'll have them around your house. So what we have are these small white or clear looking crystals that almost look like small diamonds. These we can then use and we're gonna grow these small ones and we're gonna use them as seeds to grow a bigger crystal like this one. I'll hold that up so that you can see it a little bit better. You can grow one that size or you can grow it even larger. It just depends on how long you wanna keep it in our growing solution, which we'll show you how to make. So the great thing about the smaller crystals that we grew here is that, like I said, everything is pretty much going to be using materials you have around your own house. So let's go through and look at all of the materials that we're going to need. So we are going to start off with we will need one cup of hot water. It does not need to be boiling water, but it does need to be hot. Um, I put our water in the microwave for about a minute and a half or so. You can use tap water or if you want to use distilled water, which is a special kind of water that you can grow in the grocery store, feel free. Um, you're also going to need alum. And this is alum, A-L-U-M. And it looks very much like a very finely grated salt. Now, alum is used in pickling. Uh, if you're ever having a pickle and it, you have a nice crunch to it, that's thanks to alum. So we're gonna be using somewhere between three and four tablespoons of alum. You're also going to need two cups. I've got a tall glass cup here and I have a shorter, one, a shorter container here. You can use two tall cups, you can use two shorter cups. You just need to be able to make sure that uh, when you are suspending one of your crystals, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that you've got enough room that the crystal does not touch any of the sides of the container. You'll also need a tablespoon so that that way you can measure out the alum and a smaller spoon, whether it's in a quarter teaspoon or even just a regular spoon, because we're going to need to chop up those seedlings that we create to make that bigger uh, crystal. You're also going to need a stick or a pencil. I'm using a chopstick. Something that you'll be able to tie a string around to suspend your crystal and that it will go across your glass and it's not going to move and it's definitely not going to drop into the glass. So got that. Then we were talking about string. So here we have a clear nylon fishing string. You can use nylon fishing string, you can use thread, it's up to you. The benefits of using nylon fishing cord is that when you're growing your crystal um, and you have it suspended, all of the seedlings and the salt particle or the alum particles are going to attach to the bigger crystal and not to the string. Whereas if you use a string or a thread, what it will do is it will grow that bigger crystal, but it's also going to have smaller crystals along the thread and that's fine as well. But just so that you know the benefits and the um, differences between the two. You're also going to need paper towels to cover your container and you're going to need scissors to be able to cut your thread. So those are all of our materials. Now let's go ahead and let's 
start working on building our crystal. So what we'll do is we are going to start with this nylon cup. We have our alum. I've already pre-measured in about three tablespoons and we have our hot water. So you're gonna start off by pouring in your hot water. And then you're gonna gradually mix in the alum. So you don't dump it all in at once, but you're gonna stir it until everything dissolves. So the water will become clear. And the goal is that you're going to add alum until it won't dissolve in the water anymore. All right, so I've got the first set. And now I'm gonna start, and you may have to work at it a little bit as you get closer to that three and four tablespoon mark because you're gonna be getting close to the saturation point. So what you can do is you can crunch it up with your spoon to make sure that everything gets dissolved. Um, one of the things that I also like to do is I will switch directions of where I'm stirring. It seems it, to uh, help speed things along a little bit, or at least I like to think it does. All right, I'm gonna add in this last little bit. But just remember that um, if you get to the point where you're starting to see that the alum is gathering on the bottom and it just will not dissolve, don't keep adding all of the alum. You'll have it, um, once the water is saturated with alum, you're good to go. But if it looks like you keep, you continue to dissolve everything and you, then go ahead and add a little bit more. It's just really going to be what you're seeing with your individual cup. Okay, so now we've got that. It's all mixed together. And what you're gonna do, take a paper towel, put it over the top so that that way nothing drops in. And then you are just going to let that sit for about 18 to 24 hours. And when you do that, the crystals are gonna start growing on the bottom of the cup. And it's really fun to kind of come and keep checking back to see the progress of the growth of the crystals on the bottom. Um, I usually will start seeing growth of the crystals um, within a couple of hours. And then it's just fun to watch it grow more and more. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set this aside. You also want to leave it in a place where it's not going to be disturbed. It's not going to be shaken or rocked. So make sure that you have it in a secure place and maybe even put a sign up there saying, please do not disturb. Um, so that that way nobody in your family will go ahead and mess with it. Now, I've already started another one a day ago. So I'm going to share that with you. So we have this cup that's got crystals in it and there are crystals down at the bottom so what we need to do is we need to get those crystals out of there so for this part I'm going to grab my taller cup and I'm also going to grab my paper towels and we're going to use our paper towels as a filter so I'm going to push this in just a little bit and then I'm going to very carefully pour the water in because we're going to reuse this water. So we don't want it to completely disappear. And then I'm going to pull out the filter and I'm going to go ahead and place this in the sink so that we don't get water all over the place. Now, at the bottom, we have this layer of crystals. So this is where you can take your spoon and you're just gonna start crunching and you can break it up. I'm actually going to move our blue crystal and you can hear and see it's 
some of these bigger crystals that are dropping down. So we'll go ahead, we'll very gently pull these down. And now we have these big crystals. Now you have to be very gentle with these because they're, they're very loosely connected together. The crystals that we have here are a bit more dried out, so they're much easier to use. So I would encourage you to let your crystals dry out before you try doing this next step. Otherwise your crystals are gonna disintegrate in your hands, which the first time that I did this, that's exactly what happened. I grabbed a couple of these bigger crystals thinking, oh, this will be easy. I can tie my string around it and move it really quickly. And every single time they disintegrated in my hands. So I would encourage you to let them dry out a little bit. So while they're drying, these will dry out. And just to show you, these are some pretty big size crystals but there's lots of crystals one on top of another. And so that's where they will start kind of breaking apart. So instead, to show you how to grow that bigger crystal, we're gonna use some of these crystals that we've already got. So I'm gonna go for this one, it's already dried out. And we're gonna take that crystal and for this experiment, so that you'll, you can actually see things, I'm going to use a thread so that that way it will hopefully show up a little bit more for you. And let me move these out of the way. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna very gently take that crystal and you're gonna tie your string around it. And I would encourage you if you have somebody nearby that can help you to have them help you with this this is for me the hardest part of this entire experiment is getting the string to attach and not break I don't know if you just saw that but it's just it keeps slipping so one thing that I've done when it's just me by myself tying this is I will pre-loop, I will create the loop first. And then I slip my crystal underneath and very, very gently work on getting it to tie. But these crystals sometimes do not, they don't like to be tied up. So we are going to try this Again, so like we always do in science, if you at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna do that loop. Be really gentle. Make sure I don't knock it out of the loop. I've done that before too. So you're just going to gently knot it. So now we have our crystal that's suspended. So I'm going to gently put that down. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab my top stick. I'm going to cut off this extra string on the one end and then now I'm going to tie a knot of string around uh, my chopstick so that way it will stay on nice and tight so now we've got this looped and we're going to be putting it in here. So what you can do is you can just twist this until it's settling down and you can see that your crystal is in the glass 
but it's not touching the sides or the bottom. And with this extra string, I just make sure that the extra length of string gets cut off so that it doesn't get in the way and somebody doesn't accidentally pull it. So now what you'll do is you'll pour that water back in. Okay. And you're going to double check your crystal. And our crystal is nice and it's not touching anything. It's suspended under a lot of water. And now we are just going to grab another paper towel, or you can always reuse the one that you used earlier. And you're going to use that to cover it to make sure that nothing falls in. You'll leave that for about a day. And after a day or so, you're going to see that that crystal is growing and it grows into something about this big. You may also notice that you'll have another new layer of crystals at the bottom, which is okay. And what you can do is you can leave this in there as long as you want to continue to grow your crystal. Thank you again for joining us for today's 60 Science. We hope that you've learned more about computers and better understand how advancements in the 1950s and 60s with semiconductors, transistors, and so many other technological advances really affect how we run our everyday lives. We look forward to seeing you at our next program in April that will focus on the Cold War, looking at spy planes and invisible messages. We want to send a special thank you to Texas Instruments and the Texas Instruments Alumni Association for supporting this program and to Max Post for being our guest speaker today. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.